How many blank CDRs have I owned in my life? I couldn't even guess. I mean, I know I've had dozens of 100 disc spindles, so the amount has to be up in the thousands at least, but let's be real. Even with my interest in less interesting things, I have never paid any attention to CDRs. I mean, really almost anyone who was computing in the 2000s owned their share of blanks and produced more than their share of coasters. But it's no big deal, right? You miss burn a disc, just chuck it in the trash. It's a CDR. They're worthless and interchangeable. Nobody mourns CDRs. I mean, if you're going to the store to buy some, besides making sure you don't get the Fry's Electronic store brand, rip, by the way, hardly anyone even checks what brand or variety they're getting. I mean, they're all pretty much the same. Now, there are more differences between brands and varieties than you might realize, but if I tried to make a video about that, I really wouldn't have much to say. There is, however, quite a bit to say about this brand. This is a disc so special that it actually has a name you'll remember. It's the Rico Encrypties, and as the name suggests, this is an encrypted CDR, which doesn't make a lick of sense. I mean, the words form valid English grammar, but they don't connect in a sensible way. A CD can't be encrypted. They don't contain any active processes. They're just a static medium on which one can store bits in the same way that you could write encrypted information on a piece of paper. This is basically just a piece of paper that a computer can write on. So encrypted CDR is an absurd claim. And we'll get into how that actually works and what it really means, but it's not actually what makes this disc special. The really exciting thing is far less prominent on the package. Up here in the corner, there's this little peculiar logo, and next to it are the words Rico Hybrid CDR. And so you don't leave before I can explain that, here's what it means. This is a recordable disc, a CDR, that also came with data already on it in a non-recordable area that works the same way as a normal CD-ROM. So forget the encryption. This, this is the cool part. In fact, I know that there's a few people watching out there that just stood up from their chairs and pointed speechless at the screen because they read the same books I did, books that described a technology by this name. But like me, they assumed it never panned out, that nobody ever actually made this type of disc. But they did make them. I have them, they're real, and they're stupid. But let's fill in the rest of the audience before we get into all of that. Hybrid CD has colloquially meant a few different things over the years. Uh, for instance, I've seen it used to refer to discs that contain both data and audio tracks, so like a video game that also has CD audio, uh, or to audio CDs that contain an additional super audio CD layer, and I've occasionally seen it used to refer to discs that have a DVD on one side and a CD on the other. There are probably a few other permutations, but basically they're all read-only formats. I mean, you can burn a CDR with both data and audio, but we all know the only reason anyone has ever done that was to pirate video games. And otherwise, all these formats I've described are factory molded discs. They're not ones you would make at home if you even can. This, however, is specifically a hybrid CDR that is meant to be burned at home. And there's only one formal definition of that. It's in the original CDR specification from 1990 called the Orange Book, which I can't get a copy of. It's extremely expensive. I can, however, show you ECMA 395, which appears to be freely available, sort of a European open standard adaptation of the Orange Book, and it describes this as a multi-session disc of which the first session is mastered. And that doesn't mean much. It's pretty dense manufacturer industry jargon, so let's work our way up to it. We have to very briefly explain the basics of optical data storage, so let's get to it. CD-ROMs store data as a series of pits and lands on a platter, in other words, a plastic disc with holes in it, more or less, representing ones and zeros. Those holes are created through a process called mastering, in which they're etched or burned into a glass disc, then a series of positive and negative duplicates are created from that. One of those, called a stamper, is put into a mold into which polycarbonate is injected. That plastic picks up the shape of the holes, solidifies to form a disc, which is then coated on the back with a thin layer of metal so that the laser in your CD-ROM has something to reflect off of on the back of the holes to read the data. That's that. You print a label on it and you have a finished CD. 
Now, you probably know that burnable CDs work completely differently. They still have a plastic disc and a reflective layer, but they also have a layer of chemical dye. That's what this green is. When you burn a disc, you're using a laser to change the color, more or less, of that dye so that certain spots don't reflect as much light as the rest. And functionally, these read exactly the same way as a normal CD. The ones reflect less light than the zeros, or vice versa, I'm not sure. It's actually more complicated than that. The pits and lands don't directly represent zeros and ones. It's actually the transitions between them and the length of them, and I never fully understood it. Sorry. But they store those ones and zeros as changes in chemical state rather than the shape of the surface itself. So that's a pretty big difference but the way they're made is still largely the same. While CDRs obviously don't come with data already on them, they're not just flat plastic discs with a layer of dye. In order for the laser in your drive to track correctly, the disc still has to have some kind of physical track to follow. So CDRs have a groove, sort of like a vinyl record, molded in at the factory. It doesn't contain any data, but they do still use a stamper to create it. So that begs the question, if these are still injection molded and they still use a stamper, what if you put some data on part of that stamper and then left the rest of the disc blank? Well, that's what ECMA 395 describes as a hybrid CDR. And we can see it in action just by looking at one of these. Obviously, it's kind of hard to show this to you from over here. I'm gonna put some close-ups in, but the front of the disc is fairly ordinary. Uh, it looks pretty much like any other CDR. We've got memo lines, uh, horse books, is not some sort of secret message. That's the password, because I've actually burned some data onto this already. See, I only have five of these discs, um, and I think they're the only ones left in the world, possibly, so I didn't want to open multiple, and I did have to test it. So we've got the Rico logo, uh, we've got the Encrypties logo over here, and then uh, we have the double R. It's actually a pretty neat little logo that Rico came up with uh, for hybrid CDRs. It's a shame they didn't seem to make any more of these. Now, around on the back, you can pretty much immediately see what's going on just with the naked eye. So from the center of the disc moving out, we've got a little band here of normal writable CDR material. That would be the PMA and uh, PCA, I believe, which are used to tell the drive what laser power to use to write it and to describe what data is already on the disc. Then outside of that, this sort of gray cloudy area, that is the mastered portion. That's the part that actually contains factory molded information, just like a normal CD-ROM. And then outside of that is all just ordinary CDR writable area. It's very hard to see, but there is about a quarter inch band uh, of slightly darker dye. That's where I wrote my data. So it's a little darker, just like a normal CDR. And otherwise it pretty much looks ordinary. It just has this one little cloudy area. So in almost every way, this looks like it has the structure and appearance of a normal CDR. And the only thing that really stands out about it is that it has some pre-pressed data. And the how of that's probably clear enough. I mean, like I said, they're, they're already making the discs with a mold. Why not put some data in there? The big question is the why. Although really, I think that should be more of a why not. You've probably never asked yourself this question, why would you? But I think you'll have an answer very quickly. Why not include a writable area on every commercial disc? For every product you can buy that doesn't use the whole CD, why not include a dial layer and the tracking groove and let users put whatever they want in the surplus storage space? Hell, why not go further? Make it all rewritable. For any program that creates files that are only useful with that program, why not keep them together? You could store your Quicken database on your Quicken disk. So if your hard drive dies, you don't have to find two separate disks to recover your data and your program. Maybe you wanna burn your Windows CD key onto the install disk so you don't have to worry about losing the little sticker. Or video games could let you burn your save games or just high scores or whatever right onto the disk and then erase them later if you wanna start over. This would have been like a new weird era of cartridge style gaming. Like it totally could have happened. You go to a game store, you buy a secondhand copy of somebody else's game and it comes with their saves still on it, except it's, you know, it's The Sims instead of Mario 64. And some even more interesting ideas pop up if we examine uh, another word from the specifications a little more closely. That word is multi-session and it's essential to understanding how this thing works. So let's describe it as well, very briefly. 
The original CD audio format was designed at a time, about 1982, when making your own discs was an absurd idea. Everything had to be finished weeks before the disc was actually ready for manufacturing, so there was no provision in the original standard for adding more data later. It wouldn't make any sense. But when CDRs were invented, largely by Philips, they didn't want them to be right once. They wanted you to be able to write some files, take the disc out, use it, then write more files later and continue this either until the disc was full or until you chose to make it permanently read-only. So when they wrote the Orange Book standard, they included the idea of multi-session discs and baked them right into the CDR design. Every CDR can be written to, read from, then written to again, with some caveats as to what kinds of drives and software can read a disk that's been burned that way. Every time you write new data to a CDR, you create a new session. And while these could have been designed so that every session's contents could be seen separately, the way it actually works is that only the latest session on a disk is visible in most software, but it usually includes the contents of all previous sessions. So for instance, the folder you see here is on a normal CDR that I burned three times, adding only one file each time, but it shows up as if they were all burned at once because the operating system is stitching all the sessions together. This lets you treat the disk as if it were a normal, fully rewritable medium, like a flash drive, which is probably what most users wanted. Now, in fact, you can go further than just adding files. Uh, for instance, if you add a new file with the same name as an old one, even though you can't actually overwrite data on a CDR, only the new version will be linked in the new session. So it's as if the old one's been replaced. So here I rename winter JPEG to sunset JPEG, burn it to the disk, and now when I open sunset, I get the picture of winter. It's like the old sunset photo is gone. Of course, it's still on the disk. You can't remove data from a CDR. It's just not readily visible. If I use a special analysis app, I can look at an earlier session and retrieve the picture with no trouble. It would have been nice if operating systems built in that capability, but they didn't. So practically, overwriting a file on a CDR is as if you're really overwriting it. And in fact, you can even delete files in this way. Here, I'm deleting two of the images on this disk, and then I hit burn. And afterwards, when I open the disk, those files just aren't there. Again, I can go to my analysis utility and I can retrieve them. So this isn't secure, and the space on the disk is still being used just by data that's not being linked. So this is kind of pointless, except to just sort of declutter your disk, but the point is it does work. And all this will come up again later. Going back to our little fantasy, suppose that you bought a copy of Photoshop, and then when Adobe releases patches, you could download and write them onto the disk, overriding the original install files, so that the media actually becomes permanently updated in case you need to reinstall later. You could do this over and over, and you'd only need to buy a new copy of the software when the disk was totally full. And on top of that, you could even still go back and retrieve each of those old versions from previous sessions if you ever needed them for some reason. Of course, it's logistically complicated, it's unrealistic, and it would have made software much more expensive for a feature that very few users would have really bothered with, but I can have my dreams, right? And indeed, when I saw these discs on eBay, I did have dreams about how they might work. I couldn't find any info about how these things actually worked online. In fact, they're almost completely unmentioned anywhere except for a pretty threadbare Anantech review. It doesn't have any technical details. And my usual resources like Google Books or Internet Archive didn't yield anything either. So I was limited to just the simple description of what the thing did, which we can find here on the box. Encrypties, hybrid CDR for data security. And below that, automatically encrypts and decrypts your sensitive data. Well, as we established, that's BS. So let's look on the back of the box. And what does it say? This product contains writing software. There is no need to use other writing or burning software. And then below that, a driver will be installed once when using this product for the first time. So as quickly as their claim is established, it's an encrypted disk. It falls apart. It's just a normal disk that includes encryption software. And immediately this sounds incredibly boring. You're not gonna use that. You're going to use the software you actually paid money for from a respectable company that you know you can actually trust instead of the Cracker Jack prize that just happened to come for free with something you got. So after my initial shock at the nature of the disc itself wore off, I made the immediate assumption this was all they were doing and I didn't buy them. I didn't buy the only hybrid CDRs known to exist because I thought they were a bad product. Listen, if I can give you one piece of advice, you gotta be smarter than the things you're trying to collect.
So six months go by and I didn't think about these once. And then one day I just happened to be looking through my eBay like previous saved searches and I saw them again and I got to thinking about some very clever ways that they could have implemented this. And in fact, I got so excited at my wild unfounded speculations that I immediately ordered all five of them at great expense from Germany so I could find out if they really were as cool as I imagined they might be. See, think about the scenario where you'd be transporting secure data on ordinary CDR. I have no idea how this would work, but I'd guess that you'd just encode your files with a normal encryption utility, you'd use a normal CD burning program to put them on the disk, and then you'd put the disk in your briefcase. Now, suppose someone takes that disk. Maybe a janitor or a secretary has been compromised by a competing company or government and has direct physical access to your office, at least for a bit, 15 minutes, half an hour. Obviously, they won't be able to read your data in situ. Breaking encryption takes a while, especially in 2005 when these disks were first being sold. So they're going to want to take it back to the attacker's own turf to work on it. But if they just steal the disk, you're going to notice that it's gone. Instead, the secretary puts the disk in their laptop, copies the encrypted files off, puts the disk back in your briefcase, and leaves with only the copied data and you none the wiser. There are probably lots of ways to mitigate this, but you can't keep everything under lock and key 24 hours a day, and even if you use good encryption, you might use a weak password, one that could be guessed or cracked easily or maybe stolen by other means. So you're probably going to want to throw up some roadblocks here. Not that I know anything about data security, I'm just guessing. You'd want to make it harder if you can. So here's how I imagined these worked. Suppose the factory mastered portion of the disk, which presumably contains the encryption software, was the only session on the disk. Maybe the entire PMA, which tells the drive which sessions are on there, is pre-written with bogus data that says that there's only one session and the rest of the disk is used. That would mean that normal burning software would refuse to write to it, and normal imaging software would refuse to read it because the PMA says the disk is empty. But the special driver that this comes with can override that. This would give you a disk that can't easily be read with ordinary software, only the included crypto utility that knows how to use that special driver. So copying the disk is much harder, and on top of that, you now have a highly trustworthy copy of the software itself. See, a problem with encrypting your data is you then need the encryption utility on whatever machine you want to read the data on. But if you store it on a medium that's user writable, how do you know the software itself hasn't been compromised, hasn't had a Trojan or a keylogger slipped into it? So the solution is you have to then tote around a separate copy on a normal, unwritable CD-ROM. It'd be nice if you could just put them on the same media and know that the software can be trusted. Well, in my imagined version of this product, the mastered portion of the disk would be as untouchable as a normal CD-ROM. So as long as you knew the disk came from Rico, you would know the software could be trusted. So since the software is clean and you'd presumably need a password to write any data to the disk, as long as you were confident that your password hadn't been leaked, you could be sure anything burned to the disk would also be free of tampering. So what I've imagined here is a pretty brilliant product and I literally wrote a whole script before these disks arrived in anticipation of that being the case because it's such a good use of this concept. I just assumed that's what they'd done. I wasn't sure if it was possible to fudge the structure of a CDR in that way, but I was excited to find out because if they hadn't done that, then they must have done something even wilder. Yeah, well, dreams are one thing. When I found out the reality, I had to delete the entire script. So let's put this disk in a machine and see how it actually works. Not this machine, of course. See, I only had one chance to do this since, like I said, these discs can't be replaced. So I recorded everything I did over HDMI earlier and I'll just describe what I'm doing as I'm showing you the footage. But I am doing this on this laptop just yesterday. So this is running Windows XP, which is contemporary. So of course, when I put the disc in, it pops up an auto run menu and it's very simple. We just have create disc and copy files to hard drive, which are of course, write and read respectively. If I click one of these, it immediately asks me to install the driver as mentioned on the back of the box. Uh, this only takes a moment uh, and then the machine restarts and I have no idea what it installed. I can't find anything in device manager or under the drivers for the CD-ROM. So who knows what that did to my system? Now, when starting the program and selecting write disk, it prompts me for a password. I have no idea what kind of encryption this uses. They don't seem to mention anywhere. Uh, there's no info online that I can find, even on an archive of Rico's website. Uh, there isn't anything in the very limited documentation included with the thing, so who knows how secure this ever actually was. All I know is that the password is limited to 10 alphanumeric characters, so I chose horse books. 
The effective date lets you set dates before and after which the data can't be decrypted. Again, the manual doesn't give any proposed use cases for this, but uh, suppose you're planning a meeting where you're gonna be bringing sensitive data on a particular day, and you wanna make sure that even if someone borrows the disk, they won't be able to read it ahead of time, even if they've guessed your password since you set it to your birthday. That'd be pretty useful, and of course, having data expire is universally useful. Everybody likes that. So this is thin security for sure, but at least it's there. So I enter that info, I hit OK, and I get the disk writing interface. And this is a good moment to point out that this software is threadbare, perhaps unsurprisingly. The options are extremely limited. Security settings just brings up that same dialogue with the password and the dates, and writing settings just lets you choose where the temp folder will be on your hard drive. That's it. The writing interface itself is barren. There's no browse button, you can't see any metadata on anything. The only way to use this is to open an explorer window, find the files you want, and drag them into this window, which is a really strange way to do things. But I went ahead and created some highly confidential documents, things I can't have anyone knowing about, and I dragged them into the window, and I hit burn. Besides asking what speed and drive you want to use and whether I want to close the disk, the burning process is pretty ordinary. It's nice enough to tell you which stage of the procedure it's in, you know, when it's encrypting the software and then when it's actually burning the disk and so on. But otherwise, it just does what it does. So with the disk written, I can now go to the copy files interface and sure enough, there's my session and there's my files. So by now, we can already tell this software was not developed at great expense, but now we see our first detail that's outright worrying. We're looking at the files on the disk and we didn't have to put in a password to see them. Is that just because we're still running the software and it cached our password from earlier or would it have done that anyway? Well, first let's see if we can actually read the files without a password. Clicking on the icons does nothing. Uh, you can't view their size or their file times. You can't open them in place. There's no thumbnails. Again, this program is very simple. The name of the dialog is copy files to hard drive because that's the only thing it does. So we have to actually extract the files and now it asks for a password, so at least there's that. The files extract, they can now be read, so the basic encryption decryption is working. But still, does this mean that encryptees will expose the file names on the disk in the plane as soon as you start it without requiring a password? Let's check. Yes, it does. I am not a security expert by far. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't claim I do. I'm just regurgitating the most common sense crap imaginable. This is still immediately a total condemnation of the software. Even in 2005, when this was made, the usefulness of metadata was well known. What if some executive tried to securely store a file but named it Big Corp Purchase Proposal .doc? Someone snooping in your briefcase for five minutes wouldn't be able to tell what was in the file, but they would certainly know that you were planning to sell the company to Big Corp. And there's no reason for this. Even if the data was being stored on the disk as separate files, they could still be given meaningless names. And that's not even the case. If we open the disk in Explorer, we can see a folder called Session01, in which the data is clearly stored in an encrypted object named Archive. The file names are coming from a separate file called files.list, which contains these numbers that presumably give the start and stop offsets for each archived item, and then the names right next to them in plain text. There is no justification for this other than rank incompetence. This product is basically fraudulent bullshit, but let's press on. The only other function is to write more files in another session. It does support that. So I just grabbed some random data, some videos from some games I had installed, uh, including apparently a Miami Vice game I didn't even know I had, and I burned those. The process was exactly the same, and when I was done, I got a second tab showing the second session and its files. There's a couple things worth pointing out here. Neither of these sessions is marked with any kind of metadata. There's no timestamp saying when it was burned or the name of the user account or the machine that it was burned on. So if someone tried to tamper with this disk by adding new data to it, even if they were incredibly sloppy and careless, there's nothing that could potentially give away that fact. Not that this would really matter as we'll address in a little bit. Also, per the manual, the maximum number of sessions is 20 and as far as I can tell, they chose this number just because that's how many tabs they could fit in a 640x480 screen with their 2005-esque custom tab control. Sure, they could have used several different built-in Windows controls that can handle a lot more tabs, or a drop-down box, or an icon view, but now nah, we gotta use that custom tab control that we spent $15,000 on, but only differs from the Windows one by having a single pixel knocked off of each corner. 
I in fact know that there's no technical limitation here because the program just stores each session in a folder named session 01, session 02, and so on. They could have named them easily up to session 99 with no trouble, and that's also the number of sessions you can put on a CDR. So this is completely arbitrary. And at this point, you've seen the entire product, so let's pivot to the technical and talk a little more about sessions. Because I said I had some very clever ideas about trickery they could have done with that that would have made this remarkably secure. So did they do that? No, of course not. Not only is their solution nothing like what I guessed, it's actually so basic and so terrible that all of my fantasy scenarios about how this would be great instead highlight the failings it actually has. Every advantage I thought of is actually the polar opposite of a problem these disks have. First, it's written like a completely normal CDR. When you add files to the disk, the crypto software just makes a new session, puts the files in a new folder, and writes it out. That's it. There's no secret unlisted table of contents or check some hidden in a subchannel track to check for tampering. Nothing like that. When the program starts, it just looks for folders called session 01 through session 20. That's it. This means uh, not only that normal CD burners can read the disk, but that anyone who just pops into a Windows, Mac, or Linux PC can simply drag the files onto their hard drive. So the easiest possible method of exfiltrating the data is right there in front of you, especially since that'll also get you a copy of the crypto software itself. It refuses to run unless it detects a hybrid CD, but I doubt it would take long for any motivated attacker to bypass that check, and now you'll have a convenient copy of the software to dissect. Great. Secondly, and I only include this because you might have wondered, that expiration date feature, it's not utterly feckless, but of course it's not any better than you'd expect. The simplest bypass would be to just roll back your system clock to a day when it was valid, and they did try a little bit to catch that. If you put the disk into a machine that's set to the right date, it will bypass the check. But if you're actually past the date when you first open the software, even if you then roll your clock back, it still won't work when you reopen it. But it's just a cheap trick. It writes a file into System32 that remembers the effective date, which I discovered in about five minutes with a tool I got for free. I deleted the file, then the clock trick worked. Nobody really thought that was gonna be effective anyway, but it could have been a bit better. There's no way to truly remove data from a disk once it's on there. But once the software detects that it's past the cutoff date, it could just immediately fire off a write operation to try and delete the files off the disk. And sure, the user could pull the plug before it finishes, but there's a good chance that they'll miss it or that they won't even notice it's happening or that they'll corrupt the entire disk in the process. And in any case, if they're a low skill attacker, someone who just has the correct password because they stole it off a post-it or whatever, now they won't be able to get the software to read the files and they probably don't have the skills to decrypt them on their own. So this would be pretty effective. They could have tried. Let's get to the third problem though, because it's a lot bigger, although we could debate whether this is truly a problem or not. When you hit the button to burn your encrypted data, there is an option to close the disk. This is better known as finalizing, and if you write to a disk with this option set, it'll cause it to no longer accept any future writes and become read-only, notionally, forever. If you want a disk to actually be secure, you need to set that flag, because if you don't, there's a lot of interesting exploits you can do. Since this is a normal multi-session disk, and since you can write to it with any utility, and since the factory mastered portion is just one session, you can overwrite its contents. The immutability of the mastered portion, which I felt was the biggest selling point of the product, is non-existent if the disk hasn't been closed. Uh, to prove this, I used a normal burning app, CD Burner XP, and I added a file to the documents folder called listofdrives.pdf, the same name as a file that was already there from the factory. I burned that as a new session, took the disk out, put it back in, opened the file, and what was once a list of compatible drives became the manual for an easy bake oven. It would have been just as easy for me to replace the crypto software with a tampered version containing a keylogger or a remote control app, but that's crude. We could get even fancier here. Suppose we don't want to spy, we want to disinform. We know this disk is gonna be handed over to another company along with the password, which we've obtained by other means. It's not finalized because they're supposed to add their own data to it and then bring it back. We want that other company to see some compromising internal communications that we've obtained, as if they'd been burned to the disk by accident, like somebody was dragging Excel files onto it and they grabbed some emails with incriminating conversations. But if we just add them in normally and hit burn, the recipient might get suspicious as to why there are two different sessions when there should just be one. 
Instead, suppose we use a normal burning app to delete the previous session folder. Then we take the files that we decrypted from it and use the crypto utility to reburn it along with our poisonous additions. Now the recipient sees a disk that looks like it's only been used once, so they're not likely to check with special extra software to see if the disk has really been burned twice if this program is telling them otherwise. That's a strained example, but I think it makes my point. The fact that the built-in software relies on folder names means that what it considers a session is not tied to the actual session count on the disk. If the software checked to see if the number of encryption sessions matched the number of disk sessions, it could flag this kind of tampering and at least force an attacker to spend a lot more time and care on their exploit by, by obtaining a fresh encryptee's disk and burning each extant session from scratch with their included modifications. If the original disk had been labeled by hand, they would also have to perfectly duplicate the handwriting to avoid detection. And none of that is impossible for sure, but it takes time and it increases the odds of a mistake that would result in the subterfuge being discovered. If you just close the disk, then none of that matters, but it doesn't pop up any kind of prompt when you burn a disk to remind you of the implications of choosing one or the other. There isn't even any mention of it in the manual. You have to seek out the option yourself and understand why it would matter, and in practice, most people would probably never think to consider this. And all that stuff would be bad enough, but as it turns out, the security itself is also clownishly bad, to no one's surprise. As in, I handed a copy of the disk over to the folks on my Discord, and it took less than half a day for someone to break it open completely. We still aren't sure what actual method is being used to encrypt the contents, but that doesn't matter because what we do know is that the password itself is stored on the disk. This screenshot is from a script that one of my patrons wrote, thanks Morgan, which extracts the password and displays it in plain text, as you can see at the bottom where it says, horse books. And this is possible because the password is stored in the archive file, not hashed or anything, just encoded with a 256 byte key that's baked into the program and reused for every password, every session, and every disk. Meaning that having cracked one disk, we now have the ability to read every one ever made effortlessly. In other words, if these had become popular, you would have been able to simply Google decode encryptees and download a tiny program that would just look at a disk and give you the password. It turns out that encryptees is the master lock of security tools. Every disk can be unlocked with the same key. So this product is thoroughly and unquestionably a joke. But let me stop being a joker myself. This was very likely, more or less, intentional. Despite all my fun spy movie make-believe, this product was probably not for Fortune 500s or the DoD. It's just very basic, low-level protection suitable for John Q. Public and his tiny tax prep office. Somewhere to stick his customer documents so that if he loses his briefcase in public, whoever finds it will most likely throw it away as soon as they realize that his data isn't immediately readable. For that purpose, maybe these are fine. In the same way that a master lock does keep someone from simply walking into your shed without a second thought, unless that person was prepared to attack you. And it's also a lot easier for a locksmith to let you back in if you lose your key. In fact, while I called this the product of incompetence, I wouldn't be surprised if Rico stored the password on purpose so they could retrieve it for angry customers who made the boneheaded decision to store the only copy of essential data on one of these disks and then lost the password, like it tells you not to do on the back. It's true that any targeted attack on this technology would succeed easily, but individuals are more concerned with opportunistic attacks and convenience, so I think this was probably really intended for consumers. In fact, the sole two press releases I can find, both from Kano Technologies, the North American distributor for the product, may mention governments and Fortune 500s, but they certainly don't feel very focused on those markets, especially given the price point. If these were meant for real high security customers, they wouldn't have retailed for $5.95 a disc. Yeah, that's right. I paid far more for these on eBay than they sold for originally. Of course, even at six bucks, they would have made pretty expensive coasters. And in the days of far more frequent failed burns, that alone might have killed them as a product. So the even more likely story is that these were just a way to advertise Ricoh's hybrid disc technology, what I commonly call a flex. And to be fair, that's the job they're doing right now, just decades late. The only reason they're on your screen is that they seem to be the only actual product that conformed to the Orange Book hybrid disc spec. 
The microscope photos that I put up earlier, which show the transition between the factory stamped track that stores the crypto app and the dye spots that store your user data, may be the only pictures of their sort in the world that weren't taken by employees of Rico. It's incredible that there's so little to say about such a unique and fascinating technology. It's little more than the two formats, CD-ROM and CDR, together in one place. It's such a bummer. I'm sure other uses could have been found. In fact, Rico had plans to release CDRW and eventually even DVD-R versions, and there was even apparently competition from a Korean company named Kodia who sold one secure CDI. Although honestly, with the little information available, I still strongly suspect that it's literally the same disc made by Rico and just rebranded for the Korean market. That sort of thing was really common with optical media. But in any case, as far as I could tell, none of these went anywhere beyond the initial reviews. And I'm guessing that's because by 2005, the increasing spread of broadband internet was already obsoleting physical distribution of software. Sure, only half of households had it at the time, but most businesses probably did. So why bother with an expensive manufacturing technique solely to get a tiny application onto someone's PC when you could just send them to your website? I would guess that Rico came up with this concept years earlier when far fewer people had decent internet and by the time it was ready for market, they rapidly realized that it was a product for an earlier era that no longer made sense. But that's mostly what I cover on this channel, isn't it? All my little shows are pretty much about the late 90s, but particularly the 2000s when things moved at a breakneck pace. And this story played out for a bunch of products like the portable media formats that came out just before or after the iPod. Nobody was truly ready for how fast technology was moving, and that led to a lot of unfortunate investments and prominent failures. But it also made that decade one of the most exciting times in technology history, where you never knew what would happen next. This product wasn't practical, but outside of the 2000s, it never would have been made at all. But unfortunately, that's just about all I have to say about it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe so I know you're into this sort of thing. Maybe hit like and remember to turn on notifications if you wanna see when I upload new videos. But if you really enjoyed it and you wanna support me, consider signing up for my Patreon. I couldn't afford to buy weird stuff like this from overseas on a whim, nor could I afford the studio to show it to you in if not for the support of all the people on there, like these folks, who make all of this possible. I'm very grateful to all of them and everyone else. Thanks for watching.